How's everybody doing tonight? Good? Big thumbs up. Good. <clears throat> awesome. Good to see you all out tonight. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, so this uh, tonight's session, uh, live podcast, is in response to what we talked about in 660 last night was a topic that is certainly timely uh, and and kind of in motion now. It's it's what we're experiencing right now. Uh, therefore, it's kind of very, I think, relevant content for us to explore in a live format. And, um, and therefore, I want to make this also quite um, dialogic, you know, and get input from. You. So the uh, topic that we're going to look at tonight is post-COVID sustainability from SMEs, so that's not SMES, that's SMEs as in small and medium-sized enterprises, to multinational corporations. So what does sustainability look like, um, start to look like anyway, going uh, from now uh, into this kind of new world that we're all trying to figure out uh, and some of the constraints and opportunities that are emerging as a result of the global pandemic. So that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. Um, so the first thing, uh, and I think it's obvious why we need to think about this, because it's our reality now. So what, and it's timely, in fact, I was on a podcast, or sorry, a conference call yesterday with Environment Can uh, Global Affairs Canada about the new spending program for um, their commitments to climate change. Every country is committed who has signed on to the Paris Agreement to uh, spend a certain amount of money uh, on climate change, adaptation and mitigation. And COVID was really a big kind of have weighed heavily into that conversation because that influences the problem of climate change, both from a vulnerability standpoint and the new issues that pop up. And then how do we actually deal with it on, on the supply side on terms of as a government uh, and then as communities and, and companies and so forth. So. This is something that people are talking about right now in uh, decision-making positions. So let's talk about that as well. So what has this uh, COVID presented us with? Um, I think I can say with some degree of confidence, it's created some new constraints for what we do and how we do what we do. Uh, it's presented new risks that maybe there were there before, but um, are certainly more front of mind now. Uh, we call this a new normal. So it's a new way of being, a new way of doing things. You know, if it means going and wearing a mask when you go to the store or uh, the way in which uh, companies are sourcing materials or dealing with their customers or what have you, this is literally a new way, a new normal. And, in, and as well as that, it also presents us with new opportunities. So with the fact that there's new constraints, new risks, and a new normal, there are new uh, opportunities for doing differently and finding out ways to do things that match with um, the constraints of this new normal. So what else has it, have I missed anything? What else do you think it's kind of presented for us? 
uh, it's exposed a lot of what's wrong with humanity. Uh, in what sense? Expand on that. Systemic racism, very interesting. Inequality, absolutely. What else? It's brought out the worst in some people with hoarding, sure. Long-term health care, excellent example. We care for our elderly. Is it sufficient? It's obviously not, right? Um, I think in some of these issues like systemic racism, uh, hygiene for sure, yeah, <laughs> or lack of it, I guess, it exposed the need for resilience. Charles, excellent point. I mean, that is one of the things that really I think is perhaps one of the underlying theses of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Is we need to be resilient. Uh, the mask resistance. What does the mask resistance tell us, though? I think there's a few things about mask resistance. People who think they don't need to wear one because it infringes on their rights. For sure. So I think it tells us that we need to be aware of, um, you know, dramatically different outlooks that individuals may have, right? Because people have really profoundly different outlooks on the world um, that, that's not uniform. So one person may think that their rights individually, Trump exactly, Trump, the health and well-being of society, uh, they're more important, whereas other people may think that, you know, the health and well-being of the whole is more important than the rights of the individual. So it's, I'm not saying one is right or wrong, it's just it is what it is. Um, so uh, just to address these other points, market reset, big time, that's one thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, the importance of education, for sure. So being aware of this like being aware of what are risks and then communicating what those risks are. That's a big one. It's an important one, right? And I think we haven't done a good job of this one uh, in terms of when I say we as governments. So I'll use the example of even in Canada, our own uh, federal health minister or um, whatever authority, uh, Dr. Tam, I really don't think it was a good look to be so flippant about the use of masks out of the gate and say, oh, well, it won't help you at all. And then, then we do this complete 180 degree turn on it. I mean, it's not a good look because how, how are we supposed to believe? And I don't blame people for saying like, what, you're saying this one thing and then you're saying other. And the reality is we get more information. We, we, you know, uh, we get a better understanding of the problems so the defense there. But I think the lesson to be learned there is be a bit humble, you know, be a bit, un understand the uncertainty in anything we propose uh, as a government or as, when we're talking about this in terms of companies, you know, a bit of, a bit of humility and a bit of understanding of the unknowns and the risks of, of what we know and what we don't know, I think is a, is a good way to go. Um, drastic measures can work to mitigate climate change. That's a good one, right? Because we've seen drastic measures. I mean, inadvertently, we've seen um, greenhouse gas emissions go down hugely as a result of reduction in air travel. So those things work and they can work. Uh, also the thought that they aren't concerned about getting it so they don't have to wear one, missing the societal benefits, sure. The importance of frontline jobs, interesting, okay. And therefore the inequality of the pay scale, I think it brings out, and this is a big thing, uh, is it really brings out to the forefront um, not only pay, uh, but the reliance that the, the, how much we rely on various different components of society. Uh, and then, you know, for those that are of um, if, a higher class, if you will, who are, have more education and so forth, are able to be um, more immune to the virus because they can continue to, without having to be exposed. So, I mean, it really brings out, like was addressed before, some of the uh, the inequalities that are are were there before. They were, it's not like they weren't there before, but we see it more clearly. Um, importance of nature for mental health. Good point. Linda's Linda's slam dunking. She's bringing it out. Brought her a game tonight. Um, yes, nature for mental health. Getting out. If we're locked up all the time, it's we can see. And also, I think in, another part of that is the importance of work for mental health. The importance of purpose. So a lot of people that have been had to quarantine and maybe not be able to go to work 
um, and have per, in some cases lost their business, you know, because of the economic downturn. I mean, I know like there's people that have committed suicide in my network in Montreal because, you know, they were doing great, but then they're not doing so great. So mental health is, a, is has really to the forefront. Some of the people who do not want to wear a mask is political. Sure, they have a different political viewpoint. Uh, inequality and in access to green spaces in cities more common in African communities. That's for sure. The ability to work may open global competition uh, for previously local jobs. That's an, that's one thing I'll address. How strong leadership makes a difference for a nation. Uh, Trump versus Trudeau. Sure. Um, um, all scandals withstanding. <laughs> I'll put a caveat there. Yes. In terms of the pandemic, absolutely. No question. Uh, yeah. Um, and compassion, right? What is the main differentiating factor? I mean, there's, if you look at it strategically, I mean, yes, there's some differences, but, you know, a lot of similarities of what, uh, what happened between the American and the United, American Canada in terms of what was done, lockups, restrictions at the, at the state level and provincial level and federal level and, and um, federal level in, in America as well. But I think one of the differences there, so I mean, yes, there were some differences in how things got executed, but like the, the general approach to try and kind of curtail things was at least in the same general direction somewhat. Um, but I think one big difference was how the pandemic was handled from a communication standpoint, right? It was taken very seriously from day one in Canada for the most part, uh, whereas and, and compassionately, and, and Justin is very good at that, compassionate communication, and it wasn't in the United States, right? And, and that has a, it's obviously a very important thing. People uh, want to see care, and this is another point I'm going to get to when I get into to things, is caring and compassion for stakeholders is very, very important, okay? So, I mean, there's a lot of things that have come up here, so I'm just going to go through some of the key points that I think are important for us to take into consideration for this new normal and this new kind of way of going forward. And then I'll open it up for discussion and, uh, and we can go from there, okay? So it's presented with a bunch of new constraints, new risks, a new normal, uh, potentially some new opportunities, um, some new problems as we've seen here that, have, that were there but maybe are more pronounced now that we need to address going forward. So in the context of how SMEs or corporations operate, then I think there's kind of, I've picked seven different kind of areas that, that just pops to me as I started to really think about it today. So the number one thing that popped out was the actual process of handling this pandemic. What is it that we tried to do right out of the gates with the pandemic as it started to really come on? What was, what was, what and, and now as we are like probably going to be faced with the second wave, bend the curve, exactly, flatten the curve. So what does that mean? Yeah, social distancing, quarantining, that's all with the intent of bending the curve or flattening the curve. What is, why do we want to flatten the curve? Exactly. We didn't want to over, overwhelm our healthcare system. So what in essence is that then, like when we start to look at that process? from like a, if you want to look at it from a business standpoint. Risk management, yes, uh, and also demand management. What we are trying to understand is the dynamics of that situation, i.e. the spread and impact of a virus and how, how we could handle it and then handle the demand. That was the big issue is, is yes, of course, you know, the impacts that can happen, but but we can deal with this stuff, you know, like we, at least to some degree, um, but we can't if, if our systems aren't tuned to meet the demand that we're pressed. And fortunately, we did a fairly good job in Canada with that, not so much in other parts of the world, namely south of the border. So demand management is actually one of the lessons to be learned from this, flexible demand management. So flattening the curve is one of the major, major issues of handling and dealing with the pandemic. Um, and in order to do so, uh, we've realized that we need to influence social behavior in order to reduce the amount of people 
potentially coming into our healthcare system infected with COVID-19. So this focus on decide demand side management actually has some pretty interesting and important implications for sustainability, right? When you think about it. So think about the many situations that require us as organizations to better manage our resource use and better manage our uh, demand side management. So what are some areas that we need that that we can benefit from in looking at this from this perspective as an organization? What things might we need to apply a similar logic to? What do you think? Climate change reduce the curve. Yeah, but dial it back though. Like, like go back. Climate change reduce the curve in terms of impacts. But, but what is causing that though? Like, what, what can we do from a demand side management to impact that positively? Resource utilization, exactly. Specifically, which resource? Domestic, sure, but which fossil fuels, yes, and energy, carbon energy, really comes down to, well, materials and energy. So one, one clear area is in energy use. Uh, so if we think about it from a, um, from an SME or a multinational corporation standpoint, there's many areas in which we can, in which we currently and have wasted resources uh, due to a pretty poor demand side management and planning. You know, and we have seen the importance of demand management in terms of the pandemic. And correspondingly now, I think that one of the areas that I know actually a lot more groups are paying closer attention to, especially when you're faced with um, greater economic constraints, you have to save money, is demand side management on the things that we use as organizations, as SMEs and multinational organizations to operate, energy being one and other water resources and so forth. So an opportunity that comes out of this then is through automation, data management, machine to machine communication, um, there's going to be a heck of a lot and there is right now a, a whole new wave of innovation that is going to come into the fold to help to address these constraints. And all of them, to some degree, have a sustainability component to them. So principle number one is flattening the curve or using flexible demand management to manage our resources better, right? And so for those in environmental management tools, this is an obvious area where we can apply the things that we've been learning to this issue, okay? Number two, point number two, what is the main thing that we're concerned about, right? At, like number one priority with the pandemic. What, what has got everybody so freaked out about it? Yes, no vaccine, but um, mortality rates, exactly. It's the health impact. Number one, it's the fact that people are dying from getting this, right? So human health is, um, is, is front and center on this. So um, principle number two or point number two, uh, grassroots human security. So if you really think about it, the amount of attention that we have shifted now globally towards individual and collective human security in response to the pandemic is, is quite remarkable, really, when you think about it. We have shut down the global economy um, to preserve or enhance human security. That's really what we've done. So if there's one core, one thing that a pandemic threatens, more than anything else, first and foremost, it's human security. This is the core threat. It's the impact on our health. So I think that we are going to see, or we will want to see, a much greater requirement for organizations, businesses as well, to address the safety and security of individuals and communities, right? So for instance, 
Uh, I mean, I went today, I went to the Apple store to get a new drive and I'd been there yesterday. I mean, it is a different experience now, right? Many of you I'm sure have gone to the grocery store or whatever, and it's, it's, it's a new way of dealing with things, right? You is not the same. Normally when you go to an Apple store a weekend or something like that, uh, it's, you know, you just walk in there and there's people all over the place touching everything and, you know, getting help with stuff. And, and then you get, you know, you finally get someone and you get your job, job done. It's not, it's not even close to that now. Apple stores particularly. In fact, that's the greatest example of how there's been such a change. I had to make an appointment uh, a week in advance to, to get what I needed to get. So um, even going to just a common store now to get whatever requires new protocols uh, and requires that they pay attention to previously unsable threats, right? In this case, um, it's a virus. Did we ever think about a virus when we went to an Apple store or any grocery store a year ago? Not really. I mean, maybe some people who are kind of more germaphobic would think about that stuff, but collectively not really. So now this presents a whole new raft of constraints for any SME, uh, any multinational corporation who is dealing with people, either as customers or, um, or employees or anybody. So perhaps these unseeable uh, threats uh, could also translate into these unseeable impacts on the environment. I think it's actually plausible to think that this kind of reset we're going through will hopefully cause us to think a little more about what are these other impacts that are out there that we may not see that could present themselves. So uh, for those in, in 322, the social imperative of sustainable development, the social component of it, requires us to pay attention to social capital. You can't just think about society and sustainability from a purely environmental standpoint. I think we, we understand that. So we need to think about the social capital, the connectedness of our society and the health of the community will be a much more prominent thing going forward for any SME and any multinational corporation. So companies big and small will now take on a bigger, more responsibility for the safety and well-being of their customers, right? No one wants uh, to infect their customers or re be responsible for that. Really, that's not a good look for the business. It's not a good thing overall for the community. Uh, and also, not only for their customers, but for the community as a whole, considering the nature of this problem. It's not an isolated circumstance. So you, when you see outbreaks occur in certain establishments, it's not like the, the owners of the establishment, whether it be a bar or a restaurant or what have, whatever, are you know, happy to have that happen at their place because it, it doesn't reflect well on the organization. And in fact, it will probably reflect even worse from an economic standpoint. No one wants to go to back to a place where there's been a COVID-19 outcome, right? So, so in terms of sustainability, this whole dimension of human security and health and well-being, I think will play much more strongly uh, in, the, in, in, in how SMEs and businesses go about doing what they're doing. Now, I speak like also from a, a, a health and wellness standpoint, like I train a lot and I train people in jujitsu and you can't do that anymore. Like you can't do it the way you used to do it. You have to have a new way of doing things. And I won't go to a gym or a training facility that is the same old thing. Like, oh, we just like, turn on the fans and you know everybody train together and mix it up. There's, there's no way I would go. So, um, so it's gonna introduce a new kind of fortified dimension of sustainability uh, in regards to human security, okay? That's another thing I think we'll get. So we have, we'll follow protocols in order to stay open. Exactly. Uh, with social media, if rules are not followed, then more people are likely to hear about it. Exactly. Right. So you see these social media posts about like, say the um, good example, some of the bars that have been uh, having clearly didn't pay attention to any of the guidelines that have been laid out in British Columbia. That's been a big issue over the last couple of weeks. 
uh, or that uh, the, the party at the beach, the drumming circle stuff that they do down at Second Beach in Stanley Park. I mean, that's, you know, it, that thing went viral when someone shot, like, posted that video on Instagram. So you need to be aware of these things. And, and like, it's, you can't hide today in this day and age. Um, constraint number three, or issue number three, um, global economic impact of an ecological crisis. Okay, so the pandemic, how did the pandemic start? How do we think it started? Animal transition, transmission, mix of species in Chinese wet market. That's the running theory, right? Um, which is a viable one. And so it really, ultimately, it was an ecological issue, like really clearly, actually, that has had this major global economic impact. So when we frame it that way, I mean, the, the more kind of purist environmentalist people that I know or work with are like, oh, well, this is going to change people's awareness and so forth. And um, I think it might to some degree, but I think what really is the most important thing is it might, from a moral standpoint, I doubt it, but I, I think uh, I'm a little more kind of cynical and perhaps because um, I've been in this area for a while, but I think the economic side of this, if we look at the pure economic impact of this ecological problem that has unfolded, I think it's a very good demonstration of how real some of these threats are from uh, from a sustainability standpoint. I think we can make a, a more credible argument now, for instance, of the impact of climate change economically uh, on, on, on the world globally, right? So, so certain um, countries and places that are perhaps more vulnerable to a sea level rise, higher frequency of droughts or erratic weather, um, greater climatic variability, all of which are attributed to what we understand from the, imp of the impacts of greater concentrations of greenhouse gases, all of those are pretty well understood and somewhat widely accepted issues more and more. Um, I think what we can credibly, more credibly argue for now is that those impacts um, in those parts of the world are not isolated to them. You know, it's not, it's not just way over there that those impacts are going to have the the, the cause the greatest problems. Um, what we are showing here is that we are far more connected than I think we, most people understood we are pre, pre COVID. Um, now we have an, a very good case study of how connected we are, how problematic uh, an ecological crisis can be globally, not just from a health standpoint, but from an economic standpoint as well, because our response has been, well, Unless in, in order to flatten the curve, we, we have to do this. You know, there's no other way right now. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have any kind of sophisticated contract tracking. So we need to do this. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to get to that. Exactly. Um, so I think this kind of, it shows how interdependent we are, the pandemic. It shows how a crisis in part of the world can have very far reaching impacts quite quickly, actually. Um, critical environmental challenges such as climate change, biodiversity loss, land degradation are now issues that appear to be far more in our own backyard, I think. I think it's safe to say that, rather than something that happens in Africa, something that happens in Latin America, something that happens in Southeast Asia, these whatever. Bangladesh gets flooded a lot, but that's Bangladesh's problem. That's not Canada's problem. So this kind of closeness new closeness of ecological challenges makes them more immediate and it pushes the responsibility for action onto the steps uh the front steps of companies right it really says okay well because you know the impacts we've seen the impacts on supply chains and so forth so in addition we can expect more safeguards so another thing that we can expect uh, uh in terms of like i'm speaking from an sme or multinational corporation standpoint is we will see more safeguards on the part of governments 
international governmental organizations and national governments and likely provincial and municipal governments with respect to human nature interactions, right? There's going to be more of that. Uh, we have to be prepared for that. So some current examples of that that exist that perhaps you know, I'd advise taking a look at and studying would be uh, things such as uh, the CITES Convention, right? Um, so the CITES is the Convention for the Illegal Trade of Endangered Species. So this is a convention, a legal convention, um, that uh, attempts to address uh, the illegal harvesting of endangered species from parts of the world um, where they are, where they are, where they inhabit, and then so that they can't be taken uh, outside from that and then sold in, uh, well, like not in wet markets necessarily, but elsewhere, right? Uh, so CITES is that's a good example of an existing legal framework for managing that, and we may may see see similar types of conventions or legislation that will be designed in a way to uh, help manage this situation, help manage some of these uh, human and nature interactions that potentially could be quite problematic, whether it be uh, the movement of uh, dangerous pathogens and so forth. So that's a whole new area that I don't think we've really got a handle on. We're just responding to it right now, right now in terms of health and security. We are not planning forward. So from for those in 6.0, I mean, that would be a very good interest, a very interesting. So what tool do you think would be useful for that then? Six six zero, of the ones that we've looked for, looked at so far, for dealing with that, because it's a little more. It's not a one-off problem. It's uh, I'm looking at a array. A no, uh, something close. When I talk about safeguards, it's a governmental initiative to deal with it. So we would lead to think uh, in broader terms, in what tool do we use for looking at policies, plans, and programs? SEA, bingo. Good. People are doing their reading. Fantastic. Um, SEA. So you can expect to see SEAs, I would hope, focusing on human nature interactions, uh, pathogen transmission, uh, pandemic, whatever. Um, that is going to be something. I'm, it's not happening right now, but I mean, because we're responding, but I would expect in the next year uh, and two years, we will see a lot more on this. In fact, that's a great area of research right now. How do we take SEA and then help deal with human security and pandemics? What does SEA stand for? Oh, sorry. Uh, SEA is Strategic Environmental Assessment. So uh, SCA, Strategic Environmental Assessment, is uh, it's like a, a type of an environmental management tool uh, to help to help organizations, typically their governments, um, uh, look at environmental issues, risks, and impacts uh, for policies, plans, and programs. So, if, for instance, if you wanted to um, look at uh, climate change adaptation in the agriculture sector in Canada you do an SEA and where you look at kind of the impact of agricultural policies uh, and then how do you account for climate change within that, either from a mitigation or adaptation standpoint. So SEA is that is what it is. Whereas another tool which was mentioned in EMS, which is an environmental system, is more for an organization uh, itself that wants to manage its environmental impacts. So it's a little more focused on an organization like managing your greenhouse gas emissions or your water use or your waste use or what have you. There's a course 415, which is the undergraduate version of that course, which you would learn a lot more about that in that course if you wanted to learn more. In fact, it starts in August. So just to plug that course for you. Um, issue number four. So we had, um, just to recap, flexibility and demand management, issue number one. Issue number two, human security at a grassroots level. How do we deal with human health in all its various dimensions from a, an SME standpoint? With all the new protocols, even for a small company dealing with customers or a bigger company. Issue number three, the global economic impact of an ecological crisis, this global impact of the pandemic and how it may translate into other ecological issues such as climate change, uh, such as biodiversity loss, such as, uh, as the loss and degradation of land. Issue number four, 
new work modalities, right? So new ways of doing what you do, right? So what what is the new we what is the new normal in terms of work? For many people, working remotely, working from home, studying remotely, like you guys are doing, right? I don't see university going back. I don't know. I mean, it may at some point, but it's not anytime soon where we're going to get together in a lecture hall with 200 people listening to a lecture in person. I don't see it happening, right? Uh, and granted, you know, there's some challenges with with distributed remote learning, but there's ways in which we can we can do it, and we'll get better at it, right? And this is the new modality of it. Uh, UBC, you still can't go to UBC. You cannot go to the university. So. I mean, obviously it changes <laughs> the way things work. So, but previous to this, like pre-COVID, uh, what did people think when you had your boss and you said, look, can I work from home today? What would, the, what would your boss think? Just spend your day napping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're slacking off. You're not gonna do anything. And you can't just be sitting in your office so I can walk by and see you're working. Now that was the general, I mean, maybe I've just worked in more kind of conservative environments, but that's the general feeling. Uh, and I've been working in tech environments. And even at that, you know, when you hire the programmer, if you're a parent, they would think you're getting anything done. Yeah, and that may be the issue too. I mean, there's, some, there's a bit of truth to that for anybody that's dealt with, you know, caring, from home, caring, caring for kids or elderly at home. So uh, maybe, but guess what though, like, with this new working remotely modality, maybe people aren't slacking off when they are working remotely. Maybe can, they can actually get things done. So I had a conversation today with a colleague of mine, a very a client slash colleague, who we, I've been working with for you know 14 years. Really, we go way back, um, and she does a lot of work internationally. Her organization is an NGO that does work uh, with um, in Africa in um, helping people become ecopreneurs, growing their own, establishing their own farms for um, biomedical um, botanical products. So Moringa and, and organics and all this kind of feedstock to nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals and cosmetics that are botanically based. Really great organization. Um, they're doing awesome stuff in the DRC and across Africa now. And so she is used to going to the Congo from Montreal, where they're based, going to Senegal. Uh, can I share the name of their organization? Sure can. Might as well plug Carol's organization. Uh, just do, just a second, I'm gonna send the, uh, the Here. So this is a group. In fact, this would be worthy of a whole podcast unto itself. This is, they're called BDA Foundation, Fondation BDA, Biotechnology for Development in Africa, which sounds weird, but actually what they do is they look at bio, biotechnology in the broadest sense. They train people, Congolese and people on own, particularly women, uh, to become ecopreneurs, they call them, where they get a plot of land, they learn how to cultivate uh, and produce and manage the operation for, um, uh, to create the food, the source stock, botanical stock for um, for things that are used in botanical products. Like say if Lush uses, I don't know, unique herbs and stuff that comes from plants, they will teach them to grow that and supply Lush and supply other companies those feed products. And it's very successful. It started out as a blended, blended model of where you get philanthropic donor money to help kind of train people. And then they become business they run an, an operation where they're selling, uh, you know, World Health Organization approved products to meet that demand. There's a huge demand for botanical um, source products for these, you know, for these many kind of cosmetics and nutraceuticals and all this kind of stuff. And Africa serves, has all the, all the potential because of just the nature of the geography there. And they serve like less than 1% of the demand for that. So they're making that happen now and upscaling it. So that's a whole different thing. I could do a whole podcast on BDA if I wanted to. Um, we did their environmental strategy. Uh, so, but point of bringing them up is she has had to travel over there, go meet with the president of the, COVID, of the DRC, 
uh, go meet this head of state, go meet this head of UN, this, that, whatever. Lots of time spent moving back and forth and so forth. But with COVID, all of that has to stop. And she had said, it's amazing. Like in the last three months, two to three months, I've gotten more done than I have gotten done in two years. Um, all of the agreements, all of the new business, uh, new programs have been forced to be done virtually through Zoom meetings and even contract signing. You can do it through digitally. I have done that the other day. Um, so it, it has created these new kind of ways of doing things. So um, this whole shift to virtual work has presented new realizations of how easy we can collaborate and reach people um, in a far more expedient way than it thought before. Uh, it's really, it is a lot easier. Um, this, um, this collaboration and new ways of virtualization are the new norm. This is the way things are going to be and I expect that not to change much. So then what are the implications then this has for sustainability? What do you think some of the implications are for sustainability as a result of this new kind of virtualization of work? What's one obvious one? Underdeveloped nations are at a disadvantage, possibly, yes. Okay, one quick one is less air travel, less cars going to work, hopefully lower emissions, exactly. So you could look at your organization, whether it's an SME or a multinational corporation uh, and, and seek, and I, I mean, that was one of my points is, you can quantify less time, tra well, less traveling, less loss of time, you can quantify these savings in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions, um, um, more time with family, so, you know, more higher quality of life. I mean, this point that Linda brings up, uh, underdeveloped nations are at a disadvantage. That is true. Um, not always the case. I mean, you'd be surprised at some, uh, the, the capability of, I mean, really tech is pretty pre 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 prevalent. Lack of tech, yeah, it is, but at the same time, you'd be surprised. I mean, like Africa um, has tremendous mobile communication. You know, they jumped the they jump right to cell communication from. They don't have landlines. You know, in most places, they they jumped the jump to technologically leap past that. Now, the, do they have enough bandwidth to do like full video conferencing all the time? Probably not in a lot of cases. Um, so there is that issue where some developed nations, um, the, the requirement will be, uh, in order to level the playing field, a greater degree of capacity technologically. So those, like say for instance, uh, the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, and the, those kind of groups that are responsible for helping those countries develop to give them the base capacity for, to, to, you know, to, to, to operate, you know, and, and have healthy societies and economies. One thing I think that they, like you rightly point out, they will have to focus the investments on those that kind of infrastructure and capacity. So A, the technology, and B, the capacity of the population to use that technology, to use, to do Zoom meetings, um, you know, to, to work effectively. Um, and I think, you know, you'll see more of that. But I mean, again, like, you know, when I've been working with in Trinidad and places like this, I mean, all of their communication was done through WhatsApp you know, uh, for disaster response, we we planned all the disaster communication for for WhatsApp. Uh, if anything happened, it wasn't through through landlines or anything like that. So there's a uh, uh, there's that right. So another thing that I think is quite interesting, though, with this virtualization of work, uh, is the um, uh, is a shift in power. Okay. Um, so um, think about this a bit. Uh, often uh, it's geography, uh, it's physicality uh, that builds separation. You know what I mean? Like it's, these are the things, like here's the big company and all our RT and dev teams here and da 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 da, and this is kind of, they have the tools and, and, and that kind of separation uh, is can be can can be used in a power context right um but that becomes less of an issue now right uh if you think about it because we've eliminated some of those barriers 
So I think what it does do to some degree is it puts a certain amount of power uh, uh, into your hands, into the individual, as well as into the organization's hands, as it's more about what they produce and what you produce, rather than your position, your geography, et cetera, um, to allow you to kind of like uh, flourish, right? In the past, it was all about, you know, um, uh, the urbanization and then the concentration of, uh, of capital and capacity that would then promote some of these inequalities. Whereas there is some degree of democratization or spreading out of that capacity if we accept that we can virtualize a lot of this stuff, right? And we do it effectively. I don't say it's going to, there's a lot of different dimensions to that, but it is something that I think about, you know, especially as an entrepreneur, like you go ahead, you're going head to head against companies like IBM and so forth. Whereas if you're agile and you're capable to collaborate with uh, and work effectively with teams across the world seamlessly, and it's more kind of accepted now, then your capability has grown like tenfold or if not more as a result of that very kind of small change in people's perceptions. Okay, so this new area of work modalities, uh, there will be more competition among similar business, which will enhance innovation. Exactly. Like, you know, it's, they're going to get hungrier for, for, um, for this. I mean, you get, you spread out the capacity, so you need to compete more. Um, issue number five, uh, with virtual content as king, being concise and to the point is key to engagement. Right, from a communication standpoint. Um, Collaboration, point number five. So we say this a lot, but it's always about collaboration, right? Collaborate, collaborate. I go to these conferences and I hear this. We got to collaborate more, right? Uh, and I agree with it, um, but often it's like, well, I get people say, let's collaborate. And so, well, why? Like, and how? Um, however, what the pandemic has very clearly shown us is that there are many problems out there. That are, that are just way too big for one organization to solve. Like you, you don't have all of the skills, knowledge and capability in one organization to deal with something or one country to deal with a global pandemic. And um, it clearly shows that collaboration amongst countries, uh, amongst co companies uh, within civil society, uh, organizations and individuals is a must. Like we need to collaborate. It's not like it's good to do. We need to do it or we can't solve some of these problems. So I think one of the key takeaways from that is that learning to collaborate is going to be critical for SMEs and multinational companies going forward. And some companies are much better at it than other companies. Uh, some of the bigger corporations that I have dealt with personally that I know of are not very good at collaboration. Uh, many of them have grown up in the era of Kind of vert vertical integration, um, kind of they they do everything type of thing. Whereas I think um, a lot of these points and problems that we face with now don't really mesh with that approach. You need to be a little more open. So communication is really important to that. You need to be um, open to communicating with other organizations. It's pretty intrinsic to collaboration, um, and you also need to have an open strategy is one way that we can describe this is being a little more open like you cannot just assume that you're going to own like i don't know all the intellectual property or all the business or take it all on yourself you have to be a little more open and collaborative i mean i use this in the in the approach to teaching like i you know especially when the when the when the pandemic started to hit in march i mean the the I, it was very important to make sure everybody was as felt connected uh, to the courses and to one another. Therefore, you know, the, you know, the additional effort in doing these kind of podcasts as well as tutorials and so forth, I think is important. And, and the response that I've gotten is that it, it's more helpful. And similarly, if you look at it from, a, if, from an SME standpoint, small and medium sized enterprise or corporation, uh, being a little more communicative with other uh, collaborators and then open to collaboration, I think is going to be um, much more important and learning how to do that and also being inclusive. So that goes a lot to, to uh, along with the previous point about uh, engaging with your community and community well-being is including the community 
more because their safety and your safety um, are, are connected closely. Um, issue number six is profit, money, making money. That's what SMEs and corporations do. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what they're designed for. Um, so uh, how is this going to change? Or how might it have to change? How has it changed? What has been the financial impact of COVID-19 on governments? Financially. What's happened? Big deficits. More debt, big deficits. It's been costly, right? Why has it been costly? Why? Lost income for sure. What else? Lack of trade and exporting, for sure, just the pure impact on economic activity. And guess what? When we have less economic activity, there's less tax revenue. Paying for industries to stay afloat, uh, losing tax dollars from industry, exactly. Uh, pause on many of the activities, uh, absolutely. Um, just the spending on, uh, on health and safety, right? PPE alone. I'd like to see how much the government has spent on PPE and, and the increased investments in health spending. Uh, it's significant. It's a lot of money. So governments essentially are, metaphorically speaking, the companies, if you will, that are responsible for society, the health and well-being of society. Those are the organizations. So therefore, you know, if they are responsible for the well-being of society, which they are, this, the impacts have been rather significant. Fortunately, they're in a position where they can choose to take on uh, more debt um, relatively easily, whereas some companies uh, may not have that option. So the CERB and the related programs have essentially opened the floodgates of spending uh, and, and changed the, and actually per se, have changed the perception of debts and deficits, right? Like the whole kind of order of magnitude of debt and deficit that we are confronted with now is pre-pandemic would be like, what are you smoking? Like, this is insanity. Whereas now, you know, putting a billion dollars out to a charity to help with, you know, uh, teenage employment or youth employment over summer, that's, that's okay. There's no, no problem with that. Where does the money come from? Well, you know, we'll, we have to do it, so we'll do it. So, I mean, this perception of spending because of the sheer volume of it has changed. So, um, this, if you want to look at it from an SME and a corporate standpoint, the typical traditional mantra, particularly coming out of the 80s and 90s, was uh, whether you are an SME or a multinational is of running lean, running a lean organization, maximizing profits um that's kind of what you you know what your goal was right you you needed to to especially when you had shareholders in your public company i mean you have a responsibility to shareholders to maximize your profit fiduciary responsibility but this whole kind of new world that we're living in might change that i i think it will you know like what it does do is it really shows and exposes the impacts of volatility and unforeseen risks. So the volatility and unforeseen risks that the governments have had to address with the pandemic and flattening the curve have been extremely costly. And in their case, you know, we've, we've assumed a lot of debt. So um, I think even now, even the most fiscally conservative of CEOs who are running companies whether it be an SME or a multinational corporation, would ponder uh, about what's next, 
Like, what are we, what are we not accounting for right now? What else could happen? And then ask, are we, are we prepared as an organization? Similarly with a government, are we prepared for something like this? Um, companies are going to have to think about that question now. Um, and specifically, do we have the financial slack? So as you have seen, I'm sure many of you know, small companies, restaurants and so forth, that were probably operating on a, you know, on a month to month basis with respect to how much cash on hand they had uh, to continue to be profitable. Whereas, you know, now we realize that maybe we have to be, uh, take a different approach and have a little more financial slack in place. So this whole idea of just profit above everything um, might change significantly. So new modalities and priorities for financial management will probably have to be the norm going forward, just purely from a risk standpoint. And then I, I think this may also cross over into environmental management and spending on sustainability. Uh, why? Um, you know, the natural link to make is, are we immune to any other kind of environmental shocks that might be out there or social shocks, right? Like people, you know, re recoiling against our organization and canceling us like the cancel culture thing. So this idea of just how we operate a company might have to change from a risk standpoint, but then also just from a purely cash management standpoint. And then the last point that I have, point seven, is about a new green economy. So uh, our economy essentially uh, is based on fundamental structures, uh, foundations that are, that are capped in nature based on allocation and acquisition of capital. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say that uh, even the question of looking at capital in a more broad way is probably something that we might want to think about. Like what is capital, for instance? Uh, will natural capital take a more prominent role in the way we run things? Uh, will valuation of ecosystem services play into, more, uh, play into planning some more? Um, and as a start, uh, an immediate start, I think that the whole idea of thinking about ecosystem services might not be as foreign an idea as it has been up until now. Right. For the simple fact that um, it's an ecosystem service or linkage to an ecosystem that is the source of the pandemic. Right. Um, it's an ecological phenomenon. So this whole kind of, like I said, this nature humanity interface, um, I think, is becoming a little more familiar even for fiscally conservative CEOs, uh, therefore, uh, perhaps might be become more uh, more common in the vernacular of business. It has been by more progressive types, as some of you have seen in some of the courses that we worked on, um, but I think we can expect more of that going forward. And I'm speaking very, very like candidly about that, not as an idealist, but as a pragmatist. So uh, if we are a company and we are going, uh, going forward, these are some things that I think we're gonna have to think about thinking about being a little more agile to these kind of changes that seem to just pop up out of nowhere. So agility and anti-fragility, I think, are two of these things. So being kind of resilient and being agile, which are related. Um, being aware of demand management and current dynamics, right? So having a better understanding of what's going on in the world, what's going on in supply chains, and how these kind of demands uh, will change how we deal with demand management ourselves, as well as how reliant we are on current dynamics. Um, I think we're going to have to think about more critically about human health, uh, our employees, our partners, our customers, and our community. And this is going to require planning, but communication as well, as demonstrated by going to the Apple store today or when you go to the grocery store tomorrow. Another principle is think globally, act locally, and think globally again. This will become part of the analysis. So like really that switch between scales is, I think is gonna be something that everybody's gonna have to think about in a more, a more serious way. Uh, companies of all sorts, SMEs and also multinationals are going to be 
need to be aware of new policy and legislation. There was going to be new policy and new legislation related to human nature interactions as well as human security. We can, I can be 100% sure of that. Um, new work modalities and organizational structures are now the norm and the use of technology for working remotely, virtualization of work, um, you know, getting used to doing virtual meetings and contracts and all that kind of stuff and that it's not foreign. Um, collaborate and share and be inclusive and assess the impacts of this. So what are the environmental impacts of being more collaborative and sharing and um, and then redefine and strategize what our financial goals and priorities are. So what does it mean? What is are the priorities of organizations? What does capital mean to us? And are we are we prepared for some of these potential downturns or new opportunities? So looking at that from a, from a more risk management standpoint uh, was probably going to be uh, something we need to think about. And then this whole new era of a different form of capital or at least a more broad definition of what capital is, is again something that I think we're going to see more discussion about and ultimately more kind of operation, operationalization. So the CPA would be a good example of seeing what they do on this. The Canadian uh, Chartered Professional Accountants Association in Canada uh, would, would actually be a group that I'd, I'm going to reach out to see what they're thinking. All right, so there we go. That's uh, the blueprint. I'm going to post these notes to uh, to for download uh, from the video um, so you have that those issues any other any questions what do you think did i miss anything Yes, there's a lot of different areas that will change. Kind of hard to treat track of. We'll have to take it step by step, I think. Change is exciting. Yep, it can be. Some people don't like it. I like it. A lot of people don't, but got to go with it. Is the egg already cooked? Yes, 100%. It's definitely needed. For sure. Opportunity to innovate, for sure. There's going to be a lot of innovation associated with this in all respects. New policy, new legislation, not one area alone. I mean, I can't even think about it. The, the thing, what's going on at the UN right now to deal with this is quite remarkable. Like, uh, think about, you know, how do you, how do you make sure countries can survive through this? You know, it's like a major pivot. So it's been a complete Everything went off of like climate and all that kind of stuff. Like, okay, COVID. What do we do about COVID? Complete focus on it. Good. Well, what it does spell is uh, it spells that there, if only we can do the same for the environment. I think, I don't know, it will come come that's part of your job really um, is to what this like what I've tried to kind of present to you is something that you could use to present to your bosses and your organizations to say look I mean this is kind of the these are some things that are happening uh, as a result of this and therefore um, I think we should pay attention to these issues and roll it into an environmental strategy or sustainability strategy now we'll differ widely between different organizations, like if you're in a mining company or whatever. Um, but I think at least what this does is it gives you like talking points that are pretty substantial, like pretty credible, I would say, 
I mean, it's hard to argue these different things that are because they're happening right now. But if you position it in terms of like the business case, then you will get airtime from the CEO. Both the potential for profit, like of viability of the SME or the multinational corporation, where's the opportunity and where's the downside risk? Where can we lose and where can we win? And what is our obligation? That's the language. That is the language of CEOs. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you very much for coming out. Again, this has been recorded. I'll download it and I will post it to YouTube and let you know when it's up for anybody else that couldn't make it, as well as the notes. Uh, last week was a little uh, difficult, so I got a bit behind on posting the podcast, so both will go up uh, tomorrow. Uh, um, but that's life. Sometimes you need to shift your priorities. All right. So for those in 660, tomorrow, 6 p.m., tutorial. Uh, for those in other whatever's courses, we don't have that. <laughs> you're, you're not invited. Uh, but hopefully you can come out next week, and I will be promoting these a little more widely.